This is more than a festival. This is the beginning of transformation in our streets. This is a time of empowering people to live what they believe, equipping them to live like Jesus so they can engage God's love in their communities. This is church, but not as you know it. It's so much more than a gathering of people. This is power to the peaceful. More than church curtains and a keyboard. This is open air outreach, not closed door cathedrals. This is a rising up of prayerful people. Soaring like eagles with God as the artist, we as the canvas and the church as the easel. This is hope, unity, peace in action. Because when we come together, the denominational lines are laid down, cultural lines fade out and God's will plays out. This is more than a festival, more than music, more than another event. It's a movement of hope, a campaign of compassion, a message to the masses with one vision, Jesus. So be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wow, how exciting was that? Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're really excited about today. And I just introduce myself. I'm Deborah Green. I am the founding director of a charity called Redeeming Our Communities. We call it Rock for short. We're all about encouraging churches to work together for community transformation and I also have the privilege of leading a team uh, for Festival Manchester which we call Love Where You Live which says it exactly as it is it's about social action showing the community and the people of the community that we love them and that's what today's webinar is all about so we're really excited that you've got to join us and I'm here in the studio with uh, Gary Smith. Hi Gary, how are you doing this morning? Great Deborah, thank you very much, great to be here. Yeah, what were you doing this time yesterday? This time yesterday? Oh, uh, we were just finishing uh, prayers so every Tuesday morning we have a time of worship and prayer and teaching in here mm. and I went from here straight into a Zoom meeting upstairs as seems to be my life moving from meeting to meeting to meeting. But and then yeah. I think you were out prayer walking as yeah, well we yesterday. Went, uh, I'll be talking about that a little, a little bit, later, bit later but on. yes, uh, 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 midday myself and Andy Hawthorne, the founder of the Message Trust, we went out and we went and actually prayer walked around Withenshaw Park. Wow. The, going back to the roots That's it. there. So we've got a, an interactive programme for you today. We're going to show you some videos. We're going to do some interviews. We're going to give you the opportunity for question and answers. So do be thinking about your questions as we move through this programme. And I think right now we have actually got a video which really explains to us a little bit more about what Festival Manchester is all about. We believe in the power of the church to live out and proclaim the gospel. As we come together to pray, serve and share the good news of Jesus, we believe we can impact more lives than ever before. This is more than a weekend. We believe that a united church will be a catalyst for transformation right across our region. This is the heart, the vision and the hope of Festival Manchester 2022. Every great move of God begins with prayer, and this is at the heart of Festival Manchester. We want to see the church in our region rise up in prayer like never before. As we passionately pray, we're asking everyone to commit to specifically praying for five of their friends who don't yet know Jesus. Join us and get involved in seeing lives transformed. As we pray, we step out. Kicking off the festival will be a night of prayer, worship and vision as we come together and ask God to lead us as we go out in service and mission. Word and deed always go together. Love Where You Live will be a key part of Festival Manchester. As well as proclaiming the good news of Jesus, we'll be heading into communities, transforming streets, meeting needs. We'll work in partnership with local government, the police and other partners as we show love to our neighbours, building long-lasting relationships that draw people closer to Jesus. 
We don't want anyone to miss out on the opportunity to hear the gospel. So as well as our huge festival, we'll be running build-up events right across the region, including homeless and prison outreaches, events designed for women, business and civic leaders, and so much more. There will also be a comprehensive programme to reach young people in the region's high schools and primary schools. World-class bands and mission teams will work alongside local churches to impact this generation. To make sure no one misses out, we'll be putting significant resources so that everyone can hear about Festival Manchester 2022, building excitement for what we believe could be the biggest mission our region has ever seen. Every step of the way, we'll be equipping and training people in how to share the good news and introduce their friends to Jesus. We'll help them understand their decision, encourage and pray with them and connect them with local churches. And all this climax is from the 1st to the 3rd of July 2022, right here in Withenshaw Park. A weekend packed with family-friendly activities, performances from some of the best-known Christian artists, jaw-dropping stunts from world-class athletes, a family fun zone, a skate park, and so much more. All with multiple opportunities every day for people to hear and respond to the gospel. As the church steps out in prayer and action on a scale we've never seen before, we pray this will be just the beginning. We don't just want to see decisions, we want to see lifelong disciples and communities transformed as we propel forward in mission, united as one church. Festival Manchester 2022 is a partnership between the Message Trust, the Lewis Palau Association and hundreds of churches, ministries, organisations and businesses. For more information and to find out how you can get involved, go to festivalmanchester.com. So that was the incredible Andy Hawthorne talking about Festival Manchester, and you must be getting excited by now. Um, but this webinar is particularly focusing in on the Love Where You Live piece, which is all about the social action, the thing that creates the opportunity, if you like, for the sharing of the good news of the gospel and Jesus Christ with people, that people can see it in a tangible way, uh, that we love them and that we love the community. So uh, I'm just going to um, start by sharing uh, some of the things that we're hoping to equip you, uh, equip you around this Love Where You Live piece. And we've got four things that we're looking to achieve through this webinar. First of all, it's all about appreciating the aspects of working together in partnership with your community to deliver these social action projects. So if we're going to do a project, uh, community litter pick, for example, why not think about doing that in partnership with some of the local agencies, getting in touch with the police, the council, um, the, the local authority, and doing it together, and even maybe putting the logos on the literature. That is a really powerful way of demonstrating partnership. The second is about understanding how to listen to and engage with our community. And we're going to hear a little bit about this later on with one of our interviews today. But listening to the community, we really believe as Love Where You Live team is so important that the community feel that they've been heard and their views are taken into consideration. The fourth principle is about recognising that there's a wide range of social action projects that you might be able to undertake. And if you look to our website, you'll see so many examples on there of things that you can do. There's a huge variety. There's so many creative, innovative ideas, and you may come up with one of those ideas yourself. So the fourth principle is about developing your own social action project, maybe something that's never been done before. So thinking creatively about the way to reach out to your community. And that's what we're hoping to unpack more today in this webinar. So let's look to the screen to find out a little bit more about what these social action projects look like. Yeah, so this is Mo's house. 
We've been here now for this our third day. When we first came, the grass was really high. We had some overgrown trees and shrubs. So what we've done is we've we mowed down the grass, we took up the soil, took out the trees and shrubs that Mo didn't want anymore. And then we've laid down these rocks and stones. We've been laying down some slabs, putting a bit of sand in, and it looks amazing. We've just got some more flowers to put up to make it look really nice. Mo's well pleased over there. It's looking great. So we've cut all the grass down, taken all the bush down uh, to ground level. Uh, we've cleared out uh, a couple of corners that were just overgrown with brambles and, and, uh, and knotweed and that kind of thing. And in this area that I'm currently standing in, uh, we've leveled it off. We've uh, kind of boxed it into a couple of different tiers um, and put the gravel down on it. So it'll be a nice usable space for the family uh, to enjoy through what's left of the summer, if this rain ever stops. Park. We are having so much fun. We've got Xboxes and Playstations and slides for all the kids to go on on the bus. Then we're having outdoor performances. We're playing football, basketball. It has been amazing. But most importantly, we have been telling young people about Jesus and his love for them. Every day we've been doing two responses and we have seen over 30 young people come to know Jesus. How amazing is that? We are so excited for what God is gonna do for the rest of this week. That's so encouraging, isn't it? To see those really young evangelists sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And I've just been hearing from Gary that a whole family got baptized last weekend as a result of that outreach project. So much fruit, so, much, uh, so many lives being changed by that piece of work. Um, so I'm gonna come to Gary now, but I'm gonna um, give him a really, <laughs> uh, in-depth introduction, Gary, because I think people want to know a bit more about you before you speak. Um, so Gary Smith is the UK Hubs Director for the Message Trust, which, as we know, is a worldwide movement committed to reaching the hardest to reach young people. He's also responsible for heading up the work in Wales, Midlands and Scotland. Not quite sure how he manages all of that, but Gary also leads the message prisons work and the bus ministry, the fleet of high tech mobile youth centres. Uh, and he is also the co-director of Festival Manchester, which is the biggest free Christian festival in the Northwest taking place 1st to 3rd of July. Uh, the event, as we know, is being planned with the Luis Palau Association and promises to be an amazing opportunity to reach young people and families with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gary has been in the ministry for over 30 years, the majority of the time in his beloved Wales. He's an ordained Elim pastor and he leads a church in his home village with his wife, Leslie. Gary has two grown up children, Becky and Ben. He supports Wales for rugby and Leeds United at football. Go figure. Uh, Gary also loves to travel and hates to run, which he has to do both frequently. So with Gary, we're, we're intrigued to know more. Please tell us a little bit more about the festival and love where you live. Thanks, Deborah. I've never had such a, a fantastic <laughs> introduction. Normally people just pick out one line to have the whole thing. is a little bit overwhelming. I'm also a grandfather now, which uh, since that um, uh, bio was last sent out. So, that, so that's brilliant. Um, I want to just share with you um, the four key principles, really, of love where you live and then really dig into um, a couple of them. The, the four key principles, and I'll break them down all um, a little bit more as I talk, but the, the four key principles I want to think about are prayer, practice, proclamation, and purposeful invitation. Now, I think it's important when we think about partnership to realize that this 
is at the heart of the Bible. It's entirely biblical. We, uh, we worship a God who lives in perfect partnership and perfect community with himself as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we know that we are designed in his image, and therefore we come into our fulfillment when we're actually able to have meaningful partnership. We also know that we're humans and we mess up big style. And, and, and we have to work hard to actually maintain those partnerships. But we're reminded in the Bible, in Psalm 133, that famous uh, passage where it says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. As it, as it is if the Jew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, mm. for there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life evermore. The reason that we should want to strive for partnership, for unity, is because when we do that, God is commanded to bring a blessing. And it's a blessing that flows not just out uh, onto us, but uh, into our communities as well. So we want that commanded blessing. So I want to break down uh, what these things look like, what the four principles look like. First of all, I want to talk to you about prayer. Prayer is fundamental to all that we're doing as a festival, right across the piece, right across every aspect of the f festival. And it's key to what we're doing when we think about love where you live. Now, one of the things that we've done is we've developed uh, or we've partnered with an app that helps us to do this. It's called the, out, uh, 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 sorry, the Oikos Outreach app. And I just want to show you a short film so you can see how it works. Check this out. great and powerful way to actually underpin every project with prayer. You saw the film of the project that we did in Withenshaw where we, before we did it, we went out and we prayed for every street in Withenshaw. We're now trying to do the same right across Greater Manchester. Be part of it. Download that app. And um, we begin to build community through that by encouraging you to actually do it at least with one other person, with a buddy. As uh, Deborah says, I was out yesterday with our um, CEO, uh, Andy Hawthorne, and we were praying together, encouraging other on, uh, 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 each other on, spurring one another, encouraging us just to do a bit more and to go a little bit deeper. Think about what it looks like to pray as a group, to pray as a church for this project, to pray for your community. Prayer walk your community as a church. It's absolutely uh, life-changing, life-changing not just for your community but also um, for you. I want you to think about this other aspect which is called proclamation. When we think about actually doing the biggest festival uh, that the North West has seen for a generation, we don't just want people to um, somehow stumble uh, across the fact that we're Christians. We don't just want that idea that maybe they see some sort of um, ready break radiance coming off us and they think, oh, there's something different about you. No, we need to be ready to always share the reason that we've got in our hearts. So are we going to intentionally tell people about Jesus? You saw in that film earlier that as part of the project we had these meaningful encounters where we could share the gospel with people. What does that look like for your project. Now it's going to look different across all the different projects. It'll look different uh, when you think about the, the, the style of church you are, the, start, uh, the sort of person you are. But we want everybody to think about what that proclamation piece looks like. There's actually the practice, the actual act of doing social action or acts of kindness. And um, my friend Neil's going to be talking to, uh, to us a little bit later about how we discover what our communities would want to say about that. 
but we want to think about what is a meaningful project uh, for your local community. And I'm going to be sharing a little bit, and this is the heart of what I want to share about, is how we engage other key stakeholders uh, in what our practice might be. I want to encourage you with um, a, a verse from uh, Jeremiah 29. And I know that if you're in church, you already think you know the verse I'm going to share. Well, it's not that one. It's a different one. It's verse 7. It says this. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which you have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. We need to be people who are praying for uh, the prosperity of our cities, praying the very best blessing over them, because it's in our best interest. That's what the Bible tells us. When the city prospers, the church prospers as well. I want you to realize when you think about partnership, this very key thing. The church is good news. It doesn't just have the good news, it is good news. There is a church at the heart of every community. Now you might think, well that's obvious, but I want to tell you in my experience of partnering with local authorities, with the police, with the fire brigade, with the ambulance service, with other community partners, They've often not thought about that, that in the center of pretty much every community is a church or, or multiple churches that have got resources, they've got people, they've got pounds, and they've got buildings that actually can be a blessing to that community. We just need to tell people about it. You should also remember that when, you, when you're speaking to other key stakeholders, like I say, like the local authority, the police, the fire brigade, neighborhood management, others, they're all under-resourced. They've all got fewer pounds to do the same amount of work or more work than they had a decade ago. So that they're desperately trying to deliver meaningful projects to their citizens and to their, uh, uh, to their um, customers, and they have less resources to do it. And so that when you go along with good heart and good intent, they very often want to partner with, uh, with you because you effectively add capacity. You bring resource to the table that without you, they wouldn't have. So if you approach them right, you are indeed highly likely not just to be a blessing to them, but also to be a welcome person around the table. Now, generally, when I've run projects like this, I've... Uh, taken um, a, 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 a similar approach on all of them. I've approached the potential partner and I've essentially said, look, this is what our hope and thought is. This is what we want to do. And I talk about the big vision. So I would, in this case, I'd tell them about Festival of Manchester. I'd tell them all the different aspects of it, how it's uh, going to impact the city. And then I'd say, however, we want to do something locally. And I break it down. I might say, for instance, hey, listen, I'm going to be gathering 50 people and we've got six hours available on one Saturday. If you had 50 people available for six hours, what would you do? What would be helpful to you? What is the thing that you'd like to be done that's not going to get done in a timely manner unless we help you out? Now, very often, they'll have a list. They'll be like, oh, we need this riverbank clearing or we want uh, uh, this litter pick or can you help us to dig a community garden that we promised ages ago to do or whatever it is. They immediately begin to think uh, what it is or maybe I remember talking south to South Wales police once and they realised that this area was just so run down with broken bottles and graffiti. They said, you know what, if you could clear that area, we just know that crime would be reduced. But, you know, we're police, we can't do that. And we said, we can get it done. And suddenly we're right at the, the table with his, these people. Now, I think it's also worth doing a little bit of research, not just because you, you know what you want to get out of this, but I want you to think about this. I want you to link what you want to what they have already promised. So, to give you an example, Greater Manchester uh, Unitary Authority, this is their vision, they say, we want Greater Manchester to be a place where everyone can live a good life, growing up, getting on and growing old in a greener, fairer, more prosperous city region. So, if I was going to do a litter pick, one of the things I would say is, hey, as Greater Manchester, I know that you want uh, th this place to be a greener place. We can help with that. We could do a litter pick. Now, 
how can we partner uh, on that? If I run um, free five-a-side um, uh, football competition uh, for young people, I know that it's giving access uh, to sport and recreation and leisure, perhaps to people who couldn't afford to do that for themselves. I sat in a meeting once with South Wales Police and they were talking about the number of ASBOs they'd issued and almost all the ASBOs were as a result of older people complaining about young people just hanging out. And I said, what if we did a project then where all those young people actually went and cut the lawns of all the older people, where the older people would realise that these young people are not a nuisance but in fact could be a blessing? Well, we did that. And as a result of that, we saw the intergenerational suspicion go down because we'd partner with, with them to think about what would be helpful uh, to that community. I want to say this. When you go into these partnership meetings, you're not mostly going in to ask for permission. You see, almost certainly most of the stuff that you're going to do is not in the, uh, in the control of the local authority or the police or the fire service or the neighbourhood management or whoever it is. They just happen to be working the same spaces. You, in most cases, will have a complete right to do what you want to do. So you're not asking for their permission. You're asking to develop partnership. You want to say to them, look, you know, this, we just w want to do this. We want to be a blessing. But we think it'd be so much better if the project was, is co-owned. One of the ways I found to develop partnership is to ask them for resources. To say, hey, listen, if we're going to do a litter pick, um, can you provide us with the litter pickers? Can you provide us with the bags? Is it possible to get your refuse collectors to actually pick up the stuff that we've dropped off? The, to begin to think, if you want us to clear this graffiti, do you have paint, do you have brushes? Maybe, sometimes, the best thing that they can do to partner with you, and they want to do, is sometimes give you money. And we uh, very often shy away from that because we think as churches, do you know what, we just want to bless them. But let me tell you this, when people give you resources, they have to be accountable for those resources. And that's where partnership becomes meaningful. See, if they give you five grand, they have to know that you spent the five grand well. And that develops strong and meaningful partnership. Now, in that respect, I want to say this to you. I want to encourage you to promise short and to deliver long. To under-promise and over-deliver. Do not be the people that do the opposite way around. The project I did in 2008 with the local authority, they were convinced that everything I said we were going to do, we wouldn't do. I think it was like we were going to do 5,000 hours of social action projects. And they were like, yeah, whatever. And in their mind, they thought, if we get 2,000 hours out of them, that would be great. Well, we did 6,000 hours. And they were so blessed by that, that as we moved forward in partnership, they wanted to do more and more together because they knew that the church uh, delivered um, on its promises. So I want you to just give consideration also to this other factor, which is that we have got the biggest festival happening in July that we want everybody in the Northwest to get, have access to. So I want you also, as I come into land on my, my bit of the talk, to think about this. What does it look like to make a purposeful invitation? Now, this is different to sharing the gospel. This is about how do you encourage those people to come along with you to the festival. I think if you begin to think about that as part of your original planning, you're much more likely to do it. So if you've got a minibus, if you've got a, um, a double-decker bus, if you've got a coach, if you've got a fleet of cars, if you're booking Ubers, if it, whatever you're doing to get people there, you want to tell people about that. If you've, done, if you've cut somebody's lawn, you might want to think, uh, think about, hey, listen, it'd be great if your friends and your family or you and your kids or grandkids came along as my guest to the festival. How can I help you to get, uh, to get you there? It'd be amazing to do um, hundreds and hundreds of projects across Greater Manchester, but a super disappointment if we then get to Withenshaw Park and find out that none of those people who've been blessed by you get the opportunity to respond to the gospel when they hear it preached meaningful, uh, in a meaningful way and in a relevant way. So be thinking about what that purposeful 
invitation looks like. So, just to uh, recap, what does it look like? It looks like prayer, it looks like proclamation, it looks like practice, and it looks like purposeful invitation. I hope that's helpful. Thanks so much, Gary. You've really inspired us with some of the principles around um, how we work together uh, to do all of those things. And I'm sure that people are starting to think of ideas already, ways they can bless the community. Uh, And I just want you to know that we've actually been thinking about this for quite a long time. It was around about just over a year ago that Andy asked me to um, lead the Love Where You Live team. And I thought, who do I know? Who, um, who inspires me, who's already doing this, they already got the T-shirt and they deliver social action projects and they do it with love and compassion and effectively. And I started to build together a team. And I have to say, everybody I invited to this team accepted the invitation. And um, we're going to look at some ideas specifically now from some of the people who are on our team, our Love Where You Live team. And the first is a guy called John Hopkins. And John just embodies excitement about his community. And he's doing some fantastic work. And we hope as we share some of these videos and ideas, with you now you're going to be inspired to think of things that you could do to bless your community so here's John's project hi I'm John I'm part of the love where you live committee I just wanted to let you know about one of the projects that we did last year which was a car wash we actually got several different churches together to run a a car wash as an outreach event which was actually something really really successful we managed to wash 80 cars throughout the day of local people from the community but we didn't just leave it as a car wash we actually turned it into a car wash and prayer event so we printed out these slips which said just something really simple on it I think it was something along the lines of hey we'd love to pray for you we know times have been really difficult is there anything that you could use prayer for in your life and we had some tick boxes to make it really easy things like family health finances really simple stuff like that as well as a uh, section for them to write whatever they would like in it as well and also we left some contact details Of the 80 people whose cars we washed, 67 of them filled in a prayer card. These were just people driving past on the street with no prior church background. And about half of those that filled them in also left the contact details so that we could follow up later, pray with them over the phone, get connected with them and help them to connect with the church. So I just want to film this today to give you some really practical tips on how to run a car wash. The things that you'll need to run a car wash are really simple, really basic. You need some buckets, some car wax, uh, one of those window squeegee things or a few of those and some uh, sponges as well. Something that's really helpful if you can get hold of it is a pressure washer as well. That was a hugely helpful thing to us throughout the day. The way that we had a lot of success running it was we had a car park that people could drive into. Then we'd have a team of people that would just spend their time firstly washing the wheels of the cars. That's important to do first because you don't want to mix up the sponges that you're using to do the wheels with, which can get gravel and things on them. You don't want to then be cleaning the paintwork or the windows where things can get scratched. Next, the car would move on. There'd be another team of people with buckets of soapy water lots of car wax in it and they give the car a a really good scrubbing over the windows the paintwork everything next it will go over to the pressure washer and the pressure washer will get off all of the soap suds and everything like that and then finally it will go over where there's a, a last team of people just one or two people to give the windows a go over with one of the squeegees as people were queuing to get in Uh, We had people approaching those cars, the drivers, just letting them know how the system would work, but also handing out one of those prayer cards. This was a really great opportunity for people to chat to people as they were sat in the cars, just to explain what they were doing, say, hey, I'm a Christian, we'd love to offer you prayer. Some people were really open and receptive, but it also let people, if they weren't interested or weren't comfortable with that at that time, they didn't have, they could be as engaged as they wanted to be. After they come round and had the car washed, we just have a final person, usually the people that were doing the window cleaning uh, at the end, just to say, hey, did you fill in your prayer card? I could take that back for you. Lots and lots of them did. Uh, And and some of them didn't. And that was absolutely fine as well. So 
the, wh when you're thinking about where you're going to run a car wash, I would really recommend you find somewhere with a decent sized car park or somewhere that cars can come in and then go out of a separate exit. We actually found that we had cars queuing up. We had about, at, at one point, we had about 20 cars queuing to get into the place. So we needed a really quick turnaround, but, uh, but, but it's important to keep that flow of traffic moving as well. And that's pretty much all that there is to it as well. If you would like any extra help or any extra support, feel free to get in contact with me uh, or any of the Love Where You Live committee. Uh, but good luck. I think it's something really worth doing, uh, particularly if you can keep that follow up. If you can get some prayer cards to say, hey, uh, can we get in contact with you? Would you like someone to give you a phone call and perhaps pray with you over the phone or something? That's really, really key uh, and a great way to bless people, not only practically, but everybody likes getting the car wash for free, uh, but also uh, to, to, to help people spiritually as well. One final thing that you want to think of, we weren't, ask, we weren't asking for any money, we weren't trying to take any donations at all. We did find some people were very, very insistent on trying to give us some money as well. So you may want to consider how you as a team would handle that, whether you would say, no, we don't want to take any money, or you could raise money for charity or your church or whatever that may be. But that's probably something that if you're like us, you will encounter as well. So just worth having a chat about before. Uh, good luck. Hope everything goes really, really well with your projects. I just love how practical that little video is and John just sharing the and unpacking how to do these car wash projects. Brilliant. And I, I believe that was also a project where six churches work together. So it could well be that you're thinking we'd like to do um, a bigger social action project and maybe work together with some other churches and some other um, Christian organisations where you can get together and, and, and make a bigger impact. So that was brilliant. Um, the next little example that we want to show you, um, Gary referred uh, earlier on to the whole thing of sports and how good it is when we can uh, reach out to our community. Everybody loves sport and bring people along and do something engaged with that. So we're going to show you a film clip of, um, of oh, we're not going to show you a film clip because just as I spoke, um, the guy that we'd invited into the studio has just arrived. And it's Martin Bateman from Ambassadors in Football. And um, we thought he wasn't going to make it to the studio and we were going to show you a film clip. But it's far better to have you in person, Martin. Do come and join us uh, in the studio. Oh. Brilliant. <laughs> so you made it. I did. I just I had think... a brief stop on the M61. <laughs> the car's all right. And well, I'm here. Actually, you, it's incredible that you walked in on cue. Well, I thought there. I'd better keep going. I wasn't I going to turn around. I, 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 could meet, I could meet some great people, even if I didn't turn up in time to be on camera. But yeah. here I am. So <laughs> I was just waxing lyrical there about how sport is so inspirational. And, and Gary said to me, if Martin doesn't come, you can talk about it, Deborah. And I thought, I'm not going to do very well with that because... I haven't really got any sporting bones in my body, but you have. So why do you do um, ambassadors um, in football, Well, Martin? I mean, football's the, the international language, and whether you, whether you like it or are good at it or not, um, it just can really communicate with cultures and communities all over the world. So when I was 21, I went to North Africa with a Christian organisation, and we went to the beach in Morocco, we wanted to meet people, mm -hmm. and they're all playing football. So I'm not a great footballer, but I joined in, and um, within a few minutes, you're getting to know people, you see their personality a little bit. Um, somebody once said, if you really want to know what somebody's like from church, you don't want to see them on a Sunday morning when they're looking nice. You see them <laughs> on a Wednesday night and a cold Wednesday somewhere in Stockport when they get fouled from behind with only a minute to go at the <laughs> yes. end of the match. And so from that point of view, it can really be a, a great way to connect with people. And that's the basis of what Ambassadors Football does, really. We help churches connect with their environment through the international language of football. Fantastic. Well, we've been talking a little bit here today on this webinar about Festival Manchester, yes. going to be the biggest free Christian festival that we've ever seen. And we want people to come along and be excited. But how can people watching this webinar thinking to themselves, yeah, we'd like to run a project around sport for our community. How do they go about that? What yeah, ideas um, have you got? 
I mean, we run a community football outreach training. Um, the next one, actually, I think it's March the 26th. Having just arrived in the car, I'd have to look at my watch, <laughs> my, 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 my phone to, to check on the date. But that's a one hour presentation about how to, from a church point of view, how can you impact your community and reach out practically. Right. Um, but the easiest way to engage with people and, and, and meet them in a community, especially um, in a park, would be go with a bag of footballs, you could go with a Bible, a few cones. Um, you set up a football um, environment. You know, you've got a couple of goals, jumpers for goalposts. But if you're organising something, you decide what the format is. And so we can give tools from ambassadors. Mm. We're available. Um, we're working with three churches right now, actually. One in Flixton, one in Gorton, and uh, one down Oldham Road, just uh, near where I used to get the bus from Piccadilly Gardens um, when I was growing up in Manchester. We're working with them to say, Here's how you can go into a public place. It could be a park or you can invite people to an, uh, an event that you're doing. And um, with a football, you can create the environment where you can, you can share um, life with people. So mm. you play, play sport with them. But at the same time, you can introduce good values and biblical principles quite easily into a football environment. That's what we've learned over 30 years, really. Mm. Started like in Bolton. Teamwork and, team yeah, and things team like work, that. Yeah, teamwork, being a um, Pep being Guardiola, <laughs> although I hate to say it, I think I know that you're a blue, aren't you? I anyway, am. <laughs> only, only by the grace of God can I sit here next to a Manchester City fan. But that's, um, they, it's, praise the Lord for good times for, for City. Um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s when United were not doing well and I still supported them. But um, Pep Guardiola says about the footballers that come yeah. to Manchester City, you've already got the skill. What you need are, um, is humility wanting the team to do better than the individual and really hard work. So those three things, I've, wow. I've shared those with blokes and kids all I over the world. That. And um, for somebody like that to say that, the, the way in which the principles of football these days really um, fit well with, with what we want to try to do with, with sharing our faith and yeah. uh, the Bible. So really that's instilling really good values into young people, whatever teams we support. You yes. know, we, we believe in these things and it's yeah. showing respect. And I know people, I work a lot with the police and they really appreciate the fact that we're, we're bringing those values. Yeah. It's one of the things we can do as Christians, yeah. isn't it? And it's interesting to see that um, young people and those that might not be um, that positive about um, behavior or discipline or authority, although they might not like the referee, if you've got a whistle in your hand and you're their coach, they'll actually listen to you probably more than they might do to a teacher or yeah. to someone else in authority that they meet every day. So they're the type of tools and the simple things that we try to share. It's not complicated and you don't need to, just to encourage you, you don't need to like football to be involved in football ministry. You just have to realise, wow, it's a, it's a tool that we can, a vehicle to, to share in our community. Yeah. And we can apply those principles to, to doing other kind of sporting activities within the community yeah. other than football. But from what you were saying earlier, where you're bringing your jumpers for the goalposts and things like that, it doesn't necessarily have to cost a lot of money no. to do this project. But also I want to ask you things like, do you need the DBS checks? Do you need risk assessments? Because those are sometimes the things that puts us off doing these projects. It's true, yeah. Um, we always, through our programmes, will we'll make sure things are, are done well. And mm. that's one of the things we do through our webinar that's a one-hour presentation that goes into the details of that. We've got examples of, of the risk assessments you might need, other issues that you might have to deal with to do a football in the community project. And so if a church is involved, often, I hope you, you've got those things in place for yeah. some of the other activities that you do. That's great. And so if you're doing that, then they can apply to the football activity. And then it's not complicated, too, it's not too hard to, to do a simple risk assessment that we would have for all of our projects. The one in Gorton, um, in fact, that's how I got really connected with you guys. They, Trinity Baptist Church they said, oh, we're involved in Festival Manchester around the Jubilee. We're going to go over to the park and we're going to do a little footy festival um, in the park. And so wow. we're involved with them, trying to help them do that. But then that could be a, a good lead in to just get kids to get to know you. And then you say, oh, yeah, we're right. heading over to Withenshaw Park in the end of July or whenever it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. So um, just to finish with, I'd just love you to tell us a story of a life that has been changed sure. through your football outreach. I'm sure you've got thousands of stories, but, 
you know, we want to see lives changed at the end of the day mm. through these me uh, mechanisms of yeah. sport. So yeah. Just share us something. Yeah, I mean, um, in London, where we do a lot of work, um, we also do camps that are short-term, three to five-day activity um, holiday clubs, basically based around football, where we share the gospel a bit more directly than we would in a weekly program. And a few years ago, in um, in East London. There was a lad that came along who hadn't really ever come to church, but at the end of the week, um, we said, there's a, there's a prize giving and there's a celebration for this week, and it's at the local church. So he said to his mum and dad that were not together, not living together, he said, oh, can you come along? Because I had a really good week and really enjoyed it. So they came along and um, they saw that situation, and the mum um, taught Zumba. So she said to the church leaders, oh, I need a location to teach Zumba. Can I, can I help do something? Um, can I do, use your facility? And so that led to her doing that. And then through hearing the gospel and, and going to church then, as a couple, they realised that they really should be back together if they could be. And they got back together again, and the young man um, ended up keeping going to church. And as a family, the football activity, the camp, was the catalyst to just bring them all back together. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's great to know that can happen. When I said share a story, I wasn't <laughs> quite expecting a story that powerful. So it's so, such a great story. Thanks so much. So do get in contact with us if you want to know more about how you can use sports. And we'll find out that information um, on, that Martin shared. So thanks so much, Martin, yeah, for coming you. on down no, awesome. into our studio in person. <laughs> Take care. So um, next up, we have another example. Another person on our Love Where You Live core team is Councillor Gavin White. He's a member of um, King's Church uh, in Manchester, and he's got an example now that he's going to share with us of the way their church uh, got together with the community to bless the community. So let's look to the screen. Hiya, my name's uh, Gavin and we're here in Old Moat Park today here in Withington uh, in South Manchester um, and we got involved in Old Moat Park about 20 years ago at Message 2000 with King's Church, the church I'm part of here in this community uh, and we had a team of volunteers come doing Message 2000 to help clean up this park um, and we put on a fun day at the end of the week and it went really well, we had loads of the local community come and through that involvement we started to think about well how do we adopt this park in the longer term and love it and love our local community and continue to do good things to bless this area. So on the back of Message 2000 we set up Friends of Old Moat Park um, and to this day King's Church and myself were still involved with Friends of Old Moat Park and we've seen other churches and other local people get involved with that. We also had a team come to Old Moat Park during um, Festival Manchester uh, in 2003 and again we did some uh, litter picking and events to clean up the park and we also put on another really successful fun day, which the community really enjoyed. So since then, we've carried on doing uh, litter picks every month in the park with the local community. We've helped to raise funds to invest in the park in new play equipment, new sports equipment, new benches, new trees. And we've also carried on doing fun days um, some years as a church and with the local community and other youth organisations. It's a fantastic little local park that is loved by many people in this local community. And we've got involved as a church to try and bless this local community, to get involved and to meet local people where they're at. So in your area, if you're thinking about getting involved, look at your local park, think about how you could adopt it, maybe do a litter pick, maybe think about holding a fun day this summer as part of Festival Manchester. But also get in touch with your local council to see if there's already a friends group involved in your local park. If not, why don't you set one up and be a way of adopting and loving that local park in the longer term area community. It's a fantastic um, area to be involved with. This park is really well used and it's a great way to meet the local community. So have a fantastic time in your local area, in your local park. That was brilliant. Thanks so much for sharing, Gavin. Um, Adopt a park, really interesting idea. Well, we've been joined in the studio um, uh, by our guest, Neil Cooper and we're going to just be having a chat with him in a minute but before that I have to do the proper introduction to you Neil because you've made all the efforts to come down to the studio today which we really appreciate. So Neil Cooper has been again he is part of our Love Where You Live core group but he has been the director of 
Church Action on Poverty since 1997, so really in it for the long haul. And he's been responsible for piloting a number of new approaches to anti-poverty work in the UK drawing on international development experience, looking at issues like food poverty, debt, asylum-related issues. And in May 2013, he co-authored Walking the Breadline, which helped to put the issue of food poverty really on the map and links to welfare reform and benefit issues and the public and political agenda. In 2015, he served as a member of Fabian Society Independent Commission on Food Poverty and the End Hunger campaign. Over the years, he's seen the development of a number of projects promoting community empowerment, designed to give people struggling against poverty a direct say in policy making. And I love this bit, he's currently overseeing the development of Your Local Pantry, which is a network of over 70 member-run food clubs supported by local churches, schools, community centres, um, and 65,000 people in 24,000 households across the UK. Well, that sounds really impressive. You're a, you're a very busy man. Um, so we want to, uh, so I know you're very passionate about mm. listening to the community, which is one of the values we spoke about earlier. What does listening to, to the community look like? I think um, I want to pick up on, on Gary's point about partnerships. If, um, if Love Where You Live is about partnerships, then it's really vital that we see the community as a partner. Mm. Um, in our work, um, too often we find communities feel that their experience is being done to. Yes. That uh, you know, people from the outside, well-meaning people, come from the outside and try and fix the problems of a community, but without really talking to people. Um, and that can lead to things just being going wrong. Mm. Um, so for, for us, there are three core principles about listening. Uh, it's about dignity, it's about agency, and it's about power. Um, so th in terms of dignity, it's really important to recognise that everybody in a community, every person is already made in the image and likeness of God. Mm. They have intrinsic dignity. The problem is they don't experience uh, being treated with dignity too often. Mm. That they're, um, they're looked down on, particularly when we're talking about poverty or communities that feel marginalised. They're stigmatised. Mm and they're seen as a problem, quite often they're even blamed for being in poverty. And that's a terrible burden to bear. So it's really vital if we're going to partner with communities and listen to communities, that we do it in a way which recognises and affirms people's dignity. And that's about um, deep listening. Mm. It's about uh, meeting people where they are, recognising they're a whole human being, they're not just a problem. You can't stick them in a box and say, this person's got food poverty. That might be part of their story. But their story, they're, they're bound to have a lot more in their story. So you've got to actually spend time deep listening. Mm. Uh, you've got to do it in a way which builds trust. Um, people don't automatically trust you. You can be completely well-meaning. Mm. You know, we are, we've got every, you know, the best intentions. But for a, a person or a community that's been, felt it's been let down so often, you can't assume that they will start from a position of trust. I worked with uh, some folk in Salford, and only after a year did Laura say to me, you're safe, Neil. And I thought, that's fantastic. But it took a year before she really trusted mm. that I had her best interests at heart. And I wasn't another of these outside, well-meaning, you know, uh, uh, professionals, middle-class folk coming in that wasn't really going to listen. Mm. 
Mm. I think you brought out a fascinating point there about the longevity of what we're trying to mm. do. We may do a social action project, which is a, um, over just a few weeks or a weekend, but what we really want to do is impact people's lives in the yeah. longer term. Um, and it could well be that Festival Manchester almost kickstart something that then we as church need to follow through. Oh, because it takes time, it takes doesn't time. it? takes time, yeah. And I think the festival's a great opportunity to start a conversation. Yeah. And you know, it, a lot of it is conversational. It's yes. not workshops. People don't come to workshops. People don't come to meetings. They have chats. Yes. So, you know, put on some food. <laughs> I thought food might be mentioned. Um, All good some projects food, have food. Have some, no, have a cup of tea. Have a chat. That's what yes. people, people instinctively, what, that's what we're doing, isn't it? We're having a chat. People like a chat, but they like a chat with somebody where it's a two-way conversation. If you're not going to give anything of yourself in that conversation, then it's not a conversation. Yes. Um, I think you're bringing out um, the, the whole listening piece, listening to people and the conversation. And it also, it's something we can all do, this. It's not um, a full-blown project, as it were. It's just starting with the conversation. And some of us might be thinking I know I can have a coffee with somebody and I can have a conversation but I want to ask you a bit more about the whole um the end ending food poverty mm. the food hubs the yeah. pantries um the, we know about the community groceries as well that the message trust have those is food poverty getting worse as it were we've always had food poverty but is it is it worse through this last several years or is it you know, what would you like to say about that? Um, it's definitely got worse. Mm. Um, I, I think we could have a long conversation about what food poverty looked like 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, Church Action on Poverty is 40 years old. And I look back and the word food poverty hardly featured in conversations and reports we produced 20, 30 years ago. Mm. Poverty was certainly around, but the fact that people are now going without food, the level of poverty, the depth of poverty, uh, and that is going to get worse. We know the, the cost of living crisis. Mm. Uh, food is going up, fuel is going to go up massively. Yeah. And people will be struggling. People that aren't currently struggling or on the just about managing uh, yes. that phrase, they will be tipped further in. So there are, in any community now, people uh, that are struggling. And that's not just the likes of Widdenshaw, no, Affluent communities, people are struggling, mm. and that's also really hard because in an affluent community, you're not expecting people to be struggling. People will put on a show because they feel the stigma. Yeah. Um, and uh, another story I remember, Elizabeth from South Wales, we did some work with, she was a member of her local church and she went a whole winter without any heating in her house. And she didn't feel she could t tell anybody in her congregation mm. about it because she felt shame. Yeah. And all it took was somebody to have a conversation, actually hear what she was saying in a safe space where this wasn't going to be, you know, tittle-tattle around the whole church, and uh, got an electric heater because her, you know, her central heating had broken. Yeah. So very simple things. But th the reality of food poverty, yeah, it's in every community now. And the, for us, the key thing is how do we tackle it? Well, actually, we don't tackle it. We work with people to tackle it together. Mm, mm. So for us, what's really important about pantries or groceries is their member food clubs. It's not a food bank. It's not people coming yes. for charity. That's for people that are absolutely in crisis. That's fine. But a pantry or other things we do it's about creating the space for people to come together. This is the agency bit. Yes. That if we think our role is to fix everybody's problems for them, then we're part of the problem. Yes. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that, the, 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 the grocery model, the, um, the community grocery and the pantry model seem to be really inspiring people across the UK right now, making such huge mm. difference. But just to back up the point that you were making earlier on about um, the fuel crisis, the, the, the 
the poverty that people are experiencing. And we did a community listening project, we call it a rock conversation, in Witness a few, about a year or so ago. And there's, there was some senior staff there from McDonald's. And I was quite intrigued as to why they'd come, but they wanted to be part of that mm. conversation. So getting businesses involved, I think, is a really key thing there. And they came up to me at the end and they said, Deborah, can we ask you, where do people go when they feel lonely? And I said, oh, I'm guessing you're going to say McDonald's. And it turned out that people, their staff are saying that people will go to McDonald's for a whole day mm -hmm with one coffee and part of it was because they can't afford to have their heating on at yeah. home. And it really showed um, me that this, this problem is something that almost needs to be addressed by, by us all. So coming to the grocery model, the community grocery pantry model, I can see you've got so many in a network here. Um, that reinforces your point about showing dignity, doesn't mm. it? Because it is the opportunity to get to know people and people come along and purchase uh, the food for, for a lower yeah. price. Is that, is that the basic model That's of the, it? So the basic model, they don't actually buy the food, but they pay a weekly membership fee. Right, OK. But the key thing is there's, there's some money involved. So then yes. it's not a handout. OK. People join. They, the dignity that people have, that they're part of this pantry or, or grocery, yes. that they've contributed something as well, even if it's, it's three or four pounds, that's, uh, that changes the relationship in, entirely. And also that they can choose the food that they want. Yes. And it's good quality food. It's fresh fruit and veg. It's chilled and frozen. So it's everything you would want from a, a weekly shop. And it feels like a shop. It doesn't feel like you're going to a kind of, you know, a charity. And it's not, I don't think it's means tested, is no. it? No. So, so people can choose to go there. And, um, and again, what's fascinating is we don't have to do a lot of work to promote pantries. You get a few people through the door and they're the best people that will then, they'll tell their friends, their neighbours, the networks people have in the community. So that's, that's how communities work. Um, people will, will bring their friends along because it's such a good thing. And that then becomes a good news story in that community. It's not, oh, I've got to go to the pantry this week. It's come along to the pantry. So mm. when, we, when we did some work uh, a year or two ago asking people what they got from the pantry, actually the food, I mean, it's, it's, it's about food, but it's, in some ways it's not about food. It's about dignity and choice and hope and... Uh, a sense of being part of a community, tackling social isolation. For some people, they come an hour before the pantry opens. Uh, there's a cafe to come and meet, so they're not on the, on the street. But that was their social activity of the week. Mm. And they, make, they come every week and they meet and make friends with mm. people at the pantry. So that, again, it's creating the space for people to build their own dignity and agency which is really important, that we can create those spaces, yeah. we can host those spaces, but the community is, is, is a complete partner in the project. It's their pantry, so it's, yes. it's, it's your local pantry. It's not our pantry that you're coming to. You're a member of this, and you can volunteer at it. And for some of the churches that have gone from food banks to pantries, um, it's transformed their relationship with their community. Because mm. suddenly there were people coming through the doors of the church and saying, this is our place. Yeah. And uh, we're Absolutely. so glad we're here. And so you know, can we help? Can we volunteer? And that's the start of a whole different relationship with that, that community for that, that church. I can think of one in Portsmouth, uh, North End Baptist Church. There's a lovely video online if people want to look for it, yeah. where they, they went on that journey as a church. And they're so buzzed with how that's transformed their relationship with their local community. That's incredible. Um, so today we're talking a little bit about love where you live and that idea of social action, creating that environment for people to uh, possibly receive the love of Jesus Christ, which we'd all love mm. to see happen in people's lives. But talk a little bit about, um, just as we come to a close, just talk, talk to us a little bit about um, how does that happen? How is this part of the gospel? Festival Manchester is 
where we wanted to share the love mm. of Jesus with people. We want to do that as churches. How does that pantry model or that community grocery model fit with that? How is it showing the love of Christ to people? So I think this is where, for me, this is, it's transformational of a church's relationship with its community. Right. It creates that space for relationship. But I also think it even goes beyond that. Um, the radical idea is that God is already active in that community, mm -hmm. in those people. Mm -hmm. And creating the space for people to come together, for me, in terms of anti-poverty work or in terms of the, the mission of the church, that people can be part of transforming their own lives, that that's also part of the good news story. Mm -hmm. And if you read the Bible, that's also people encountered Jesus and they acted. Mm -hmm. uh, they took the action out of their own faith. So it unlocks something it, it, that's perhaps potential and now is being unlocked through that bringing together of people. And, and also in the communities that we're talking about, that the good news is in that community. Those communities yes. are too often told, you're a failing community, you're a sink estate, you're problems. And that's not what the gospel is. It's not, we're bringing the gospel from somewhere else to this place. The gospel is there and Christians are already part of that community. And again, too often, mm. the assumption is that these are kind of godless places. And actually, that's so far from the truth. Yes. Uh, people have faith, deep faith. Sometimes they've been let down by the church. That's true. Um, and that's true. You know, churches have pulled out of those communities, but faithful people have stuck there and lived their lives. And if we can see the potential of people and communities, as, as I said, from the, as God-given, their talents need to be unlocked. Yes. Um, and that, for me, is, is fantastic good news. And they can then help transform their communities and wider. So the last thing I want to talk about very briefly is Poverty Truth Commission, which is a, a, a year-long process, so you couldn't start this straight off. But that's bringing people in struggling against poverty into a room with decision-makers, yeah. council, business, uh, NHS, police, and what's fascinating there is the truth is revealed by everybody sharing their bit of it, mm. and the transformation often comes from people that are in, thought of as um, the problem, the ideas they can generate for how we can transform our communities, if we have access to the power and resources to do it. They're just amazing spaces. Um, and such, for me, again, such good news. Mm. Um, so um, it's about the transforming power of people themselves and communities themselves, which is where we need to tap into, uh, yes. rather than assume it's, we've got to bring the good news to this place. Yes. Um, and then the space for faith conversations as part of that. Yes. Um, and absolutely, and it's fundamental that the church doesn't abandon these communities and worshipping yes. communities need to be part of those communities so Amazing. that comes from relationship as you've been speaking i keep thinking of a, a bible a verse in the bible just keeps standing out i think it's john 10 10 which talks about the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but jesus said i have come that you might have life in all its fullness mm -hmm. and it feels like a bit like there's, there's, there's so much bad news around poverty, about, around the fuel crisis and the war and, you know, these difficult things that we're facing. But Jesus coming to have, to give people fullness of life, to give people dignity, to give people hope. And, that, and that's, that's what we want to not just celebrate this summer, but for the rest of our lives, we as Christians, we want to be that good news, Jesus. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Neil. We, we, love, we love what you've had to say and that you've made it into the studio as well. How good is that? Brilliant. I'm going to check my notes just to see where we're up to and uh, what we're doing next. Um, so thank you very much uh, for being part of it. And you're also on our Love Where You Love 
Live team. Uh, we are actually going to be looking to the screen now to see uh, another example of some brilliant work as part of Love Where You Live, as part of Festival Manchester. We're so excited that we're partnering with a national organisation called Home for Good. Uh, if you haven't checked them out, do go onto their Twitter feed or onto their website and find out all about it. And we have an aspiration, an audacious aspiration to offer loving homes to 500 uh, children uh, as part of Festival Manchester in terms of either fostering or adoption. So let's have a look at this brilliant project and do get involved. Greater Manchester, an ordinance of boroughs and urban areas woven together by a spirit of welcome and togetherness, a place with story at its heart, full of extraordinary individuals brimming with talent, opportunity, innovation and ideas, where anybody, everybody can make a difference, and yet a city with real need. The number of children in care across the northwest region has risen by one third since 2011, with around 15,000 children currently in the care system. There is a significant need for safe and supportive foster families to meet the needs of children entering the care system. Many of these children experience three or more moves a year. In September, almost 300 children were waiting for an adoptive home. Around half of them have been waiting for more than 18 months already. There is an urgent need for high quality, age appropriate provision for older teenagers in care, such as supported lodgings. No young person should have to approach adulthood without the safety net and support of a family and community. Home for Good is a UK charity with a big vision that together we can find a home for every child who needs one. We believe that the church is ideally placed to ensure that every child and young person has the loving home they need. Across Greater Manchester, there are churches, big, small and in between, filled with people who want to reflect the heart of the Father who places the lonely in families and follow in the footsteps of Jesus, who walked alongside the vulnerable, the lonely and the marginalised. We at Home For Good are so excited to be working with Festival Manchester to find 500 new individuals, couples and families to welcome vulnerable children into their homes through fostering, adoption or supported lodgings. Festival Manchester is so much more than just a festival. It's about the local church stepping up and stepping out. Word and deed always go hand in hand, so we take to our communities with social action projects and campaigns. One of which I'm so excited about is to find 500 new families to welcome children and young people through fostering, adoption and supported lodgings. We want to see generations of impact. We want to see transformation in our city. We can't wait for you to join us. When we heard there were 6,000 caught in in care, that blew our mind and we were like, we can be part of this solution mm. to absolutely radically take that life that was going in one direction, that the, someone's written the first pages of their book and we can write the rest of the chapters. Mm. That just blew my mind sideways. I was always supposed to do this and I'm going to be the best dad that I can be to a kid that might not have my DNA, but I'm dang straight going to show them the best fatherhood that I can. What does Jesus say about the marginalised, about the suffering, about the, about the children? Um, and it clearly says we are to look after them. They need a home. They need that care from us as a community, us as parents, us as churches. Imagine the transformational difference the church could make in this city if more individuals, couples or families in our congregations opened their homes to children and young people through fostering, adoption or supported lodgings. Imagine the power of church communities wrapping around them with love, encouragement, prayer and practical support. Is God calling you to explore fostering, adoption or supported lodgings? Are you a foster carer or an adoptive parent? Are you a care leaver or do you have experience of children's social care? If so, we would love to talk to you. Each of us has a part to play to find a home for every child who needs one. And I wonder, what could your part be?
So Tanya Bright talking so powerfully about fostering and adoption. The charity is Home for Good. The local contact who works with us here at Festival Manchester is Kiz Kizzy Laycock. You can get in contact with us and find out her details and express an interest in being part of that. That's so brilliant. Uh, something that I'm really passionate about. It was lovely to hear the story from L Lindsay and Lucy West as well on there. So we're coming toward the end of webinar, but we're going to give an opportunity now for Q&A. And we're in the studio with Martin Bateman, uh, with, with Neil Cooper, with Gary Smith and myself. And we're going to look at some of the questions that you've been feeding through to us, which Gary's going to do. And... Uh, H have a go at answering your questions. Well, some of them are going to be fairly, uh, fairly simple, fairly quick. Some of them perhaps a little bit more in depth. Uh, one of the questions was, how can we get hold of a poster or leaflet or material to share about Festival Manchester? Well, uh, basically the answer to every question uh, in this instance is not Jesus. That's the <laughs> ultimate answer to every question. Uh, the actual answer to the question is go to the website festivalmanchester.com we just we'll load in that up with the resources you'll see that at the moment it's actually communicating primarily to christians mm -hmm. and it, in about a month's time it'll it'll flip over and it'll start communicate uh, communicating to the uh, general public but even behind that will always be all this information with specifically with uh, posters and flyers that will be attractive to your community they begin to be released from april the 2nd so they'll be available. So if you register the website, you ask for information, you get in contact with us, we'll make sure that you get that information. Next question, slightly more in depth, okay? Can you please give details about the projects of the current guests, mapped areas where people on the breadline or in poverty or on benefits can access, and is there a website where this data could be viewed? Okay, so we've all got a slightly different answer to this question. First of all, when it comes to specifically to the Love Where You Live projects. We are going to be mapping all those. And actually, the website went live at 10 o'clock today. So you can, if Yay. you go to festivalmanchester.com, go to Love Where You Live, you can see you can register your projects on there. And not only will that give us the information, but it will also allow us uh, to map them. Um, Deborah talks about the community grocery projects that we're running um, as the Message Trust. And if you go to uh, communitygrocery.org, uh, or it might be community.org.uk, but anyway, one of those, you'll actually find a list of where all our community groceries are. Uh, Neil, uh, what about the, the food pantries? Uh, same for, for the pantries, uh, yourlocalpantry.org.uk. Fantastic. Rock? Where, how would we find out more about Rock, Deborah? Yeah, rock.uk.com. Um, spelling R-O-C, not R-O-C-K, it takes you somewhere else. Uh, we've got loads of projects that we're running and we'll also register some of our projects uh, on this live site that's gone live today for Love Where You Live. Anything from you, Martin? Yeah, you can always go to Ambassadors Football, that's all one word, dot org, forward slash GB. That's the GB website for Ambassadors Football. And we do have regular trainings that are online and then we go to in-person training with churches that are interested and locally um, with the projects that are in Flixton and Gorton that we're just starting now. We started just two weeks ago in Flixton and Gorton starts just after Easter, but they'll get listed on the website as well for the, that you've just heard about mm. the resources there. And the workshop you referred to is the 29th yep. of 29th March. 29th of March at 8 p.m. I've checked on my phone and um, that'll be listed on the resource website, I'm sure, and also at our own website, ambassadorsfootball.org forward slash GB. Okay, this is a, a, a specific question, which is, we're looking to organise transport for getting people to Withenshaw Park. Whoever said that, well done, congratulations, <laughs> that's a brilliant thing. Next question, is there any help with this? Well, let me just share a few things. First of all, we're very much encouraging people to travel to Withenshaw Park um, on, on either public transport or group organised transport. So there'll be um, specific buses that'll be going to Withenshaw Park and obviously you can get the tram as well. But in addition to that, uh, we'll be setting up specific um, um, spaces for coaches and minibuses to park within the park. There won't be any car parking at all in the park and you can imagine that'll probably be in the local area, it's gonna be quite tough to park as well. So we're encouraging people to come um, as a church, as a group. Um, 
with, with regards to specific help, uh, we're beginning to talk to a number of different um, coach companies and minibus companies. Uh, however, we know that many of you will have those uh, links and those um, relationships uh, locally. If we do find one you know, um, Greater Manchester wide coach company that wants to offer some very, very good deals um, to people wh who want to be involved in, in Festival Manchester, we'll let you know and it will be on the website. Okay, here's an interesting one. What do you do if you have people resenting or resisting your intervention? Neil, that looks like a question for you. Um, that's a tough one. I think uh, I would say go and meet them. Uh, challenge, not you faced up to the challenge. Go and, go and meet them, but to listen to what their concerns are and to try and work through those with them. Um, we really, as I was saying, we really want to be working with communities. And if, that, if there's a tension and an issue, don't duck it and say, oh, I can't deal with this. Uh, as Christians, we don't like conflict. But it, don't re regard it as a conflict. Regard it as an opportunity to learn and listen. And if they've got genuine concerns, then try and engage with them. If they just don't want you to do what you're doing, then you've still got to make a decision. No, you can go ahead and do it, um, and that's fine. But at least you've made an offer, put out an olive branch, and seen if you can actually resolve that. Yeah, yeah. And of course, that is one of the ways that we might be de defining what actually our um, project is. If we find out the local community in that area don't want it, then maybe we need to think about um, putting our resources elsewhere. Here's a good question, which um, I'll answer, um, which is, is this just for young people? Well, we often think about these projects, don't we, as being, oh, we'll get the youth group to do the car wash, we'll get the youth group to do the litter pick or whatever. We want it to be for the whole church, and we, we see value in coming together as a family. I think also that's actually quite important because we know that, uh, uh, especially post-pandemic, um, some churches are struggling with their youth work. So it's a way of getting the whole church uh, back into the community. One of the things I want to say is, I think one of the things that we did as a church was we did really well going online. But it meant that for some of us, going back out has been a bit of a challenge. We've retreated into not just our four walls, but into our flat screens. And so actually getting our church mobilised again, I think, is, is quite um, a key thing. One of the things there, Gary, as well, is like you're saying, for the whole church and for every age group, often when people are perhaps a little bit older in life or define themselves as that, they feel like there's nothing that they can do. This is going to be all big action and I haven't got the energy for this. But there's actually so many ways in which every, every person can get involved, whether that's through prayer whether that's uh, you know putting on the kettle and making a cup of tea we can still be part of festival manchester not you know age restricted can't we yeah absolutely i yeah. think also that people sometimes feel like the sports element is always oh it's a young person's thing but actually people around the sidelines wanting to talk to the parents or the the other ones that have brought kids along or even these days, walking football is an ideal thing for a church to be able to do in its community. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's so simple to be able to get people together. You don't need to be that great at running around to do walking football because you'll get penalised. I'm looking for Deborah to be uh, leading on that one. Very good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, a well challenge for me, <laughs> but, walking um, football. Uh, especially post-pandemic, the, the FA and the government actually are encouraging people who are especially on the older end of the spectrum to get out and get more exercise and socialise and that's why it's set up and it's simple. I, I can't, I, I can't emphasise more that for a church in its community it's actually not a complicated mm. thing to do. I love football, I'm a big fan, I'm not any good at it and I can't even be begin to tell you <laughs> how absolutely devastated I was to go to my local golf club <laughs> and find out it's become a foot golf club. Oh, no. I mean, I was never any good with the golf club, but with my feet, I'm even worse. Anyway, that's a, a different story. Um, one of the questions was, we want to do a litter pick, where do we start? Well, I've got some great news for you. The answer is festivalmanchester.com forward slash love where you live. You will see that we've actually got um, on there a guide to how to organise um, a litter pick. And we're going to be adding more of those kind of guides and little helpful hints and tips 
to how to run these projects on there that'll really um, help uh, resource you. You see, we've got a little picking guide. We've got a, a one about um, a Bags of Hope, which is another project that we've run. And the, the Love Where You Live pack, which is uh, downloadable from the site, gives like uh, mm. a whole bunch of different ideas and tips and also the values um, um, that I talked about as well. And maybe make an offer here, Gary, that um, we probably, between us, know somebody who's done one of these types of projects before, that we can possibly put you in touch with that person. So for a baby bank, for example, we've got friends who are running in Northern Ireland a couple of baby banks. Uh, if you want to know how to do that, we can put you in touch with those people just as we can with the likes of Litterpick Sport Projects. So once you've registered your project, do get in touch with us and we can see if we can find you uh, a mentor that will walk, the walk, walk you through that particular project idea. Great. Um, this is a great question, actually. We were just talking about this yesterday. Uh, what are you doing in prison for Festival Manchester? What are you doing in prison as well? Actually, we've got... Um, Prisons workers operating on a lot of the prisons across the northwest. Uh, you know that uh, we we like the concept that we are almost post-pandemic now. Um, it's not that's not the case in prisons actually. Most prisons are still in some form of uh, pandemic time, so they're in some form of lockdown. But but the prisons that we work with already know that we are throwing open resources to them. We're taking in. Uh, bands, we're taking in uh, BMX uh, riders, we're taking in great speakers uh, available uh, to go into prisons across the Northwest. And, and we hope that that's going to happen in the two weeks leading up to the festival. Sadly, most of the people that are in prison won't actually be with us on the 1st or the 3rd um, of July for obvious reasons, uh, but we um, are actually going to them. And in that respect, also, we're running a number of different projects uh, that target specific. Um, stratas of society through the auspices of Love Where You Live. Uh, one of those is we're doing a banquet for, uh, for sex workers, a little bit of an uncomfortable phrase when you're uh, talking to a Christian audience, but there are people who identify as sex workers, people working um, in the sex industry that have got all sorts of other challenges and issues. We've got a team that are working to put on an amazing banquet uh, for some of the women that, uh, that, that operate within that sphere. We're also doing um, a, a series of banquets for people who, who are experiencing homelessness and who are vulnerably housed. And that will be happening in the week leading up uh, to the festival uh, as well. So that, that's, thank you for that question. You already know the answer to the question uh, uh, that I'm going to pose now. You can probably shout it down your screen yourself. How can I find out about volunteering? Visit the website you will see that there's an opportunity on there to register as a volunteer. We need 3,000 volunteers just for the weekend. And uh, that's pretty scary. Actually, we're doing pretty well. I think we've got about 800 already, but we've still got a long, long way to go. So please, if you want to be a part of that, go to the website. You can find out how um, we can do that. Uh, final question and I've got a view on this, maybe other people have as well, is what is the best time to do a project? So I know you're going to say the weekend before the festival, right? Because that's Thanks, probably Deborah. the biggest. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd answer What's your question answer, yeah. no, I, I, I think we discussed it earlier, didn't we? And we said almost like any time would be a great time because it's something we should be doing as churches anyway. And, and this will give us, and many churches are, um, if we start now, it's going to have a big mm. impact. If we continue beyond July, it's going to be, as Neil says, let's, let's go in for the long haul and do these things. But go on, tell us a little bit more about why the week before. Gary, well, well um, so I think uh, one of the reasons that we um, are focusing on the week before is just because we want to get a whole movement going across the northwest of being able to say uh, just uh, to, to all, all, all the local media, all the national media, look what the church is doing. The church is in action as part of Festival Manchester. And of course, it, it's a smallish gap between your invitation, your transportation, and the festival itself. But I actually do want to say we already know that some Love Where You Live projects have already happened and some are planned. 
in the coming weeks. And I, what we know, what we all know, having done these things, is once you get people mobilised, and once they've done it, mm. they want to do it again, and they want to do more. So, it, so actually, there's no danger in organising a project in April, because the chances are they'll want to do them again in May and June anyway. So just do it. Just do it, the Nike slogan. Are we allowed to advertise <laughs> on here? Well, we're, Adidas, we're Adidas always, but that's okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> What's the Adidas sl slogan? Oh, I don't know. Seize, I, Seize I, the I'm day. Saying, I don't know. Yeah, something to do with... Uh, yeah. We'll find the sponsorship's out. sponsorship's going, mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we're not, we, don't, we don't get sponsored. We just choose to, use, to wear Google it. They might start sponsoring you. Google what we the Adidas slogan is. Yeah, to wear your <laughs> clothing is. for free. Brilliant. So, no project too small, no projects too big. Big, work together with others, take on board some of the things that we've been sharing with you today, uh, place people into a place of dignity, uh, work together, do it in a loving, compassionate way. You might have conflict, but we can overcome it. Don't, don't shy away from that. Just be kind, just be compassionate, be like Jesus in the way that we deal with people but do get involved festival manchester uh, first to the third of july go to the website festivalmanchester.com everything is on there I ian robottom i just want to sing his praises he's put together so many fantastic resources and i also want to sing the praises of faluki campbell who has been um the person who's administrated and organized all of this thank you so much for what you've done um, we're coming into land now, so the next thing that is happening is we've got an event on April the 2nd. Look to the screen and find out a little bit more about what's coming on next on April the 2nd. Every great move of God starts with prayer. Let's gather together to unite, to pray, to worship, and to be equipped for Festival Manchester. So if you've never been to one of our prayer meetings, you're really missing out. They're incredible. Tickets are available on the website for April the 2nd at Audacious Church, running in the afternoon and the evening. Do come along. All ages welcome. If you're outside of the North West, you're very welcome to join us. Um, it's for everybody. And we really want to galvanise a whole city, a whole region for Festival Manchester. So thanks so much for being with us. Please go to our website and, and uh, register your Love Where You Live projects, book your tickets for Audacious Church on July the 2nd. And we'll see you, sorry, on April the 2nd. And we'll see you in July for the festival. <laughs>